Man, today, I just want to let you know I ain't going to do a TED Talk, all right? If you want to listen to one of those, you can jump on Netflix afterwards. <laughs> but man, I'm here to speak some truth. And if you're willing, I'd love to go deeper. Today, I want to talk about the greatest story ever written in our history. A story that you and I were included in from the birth of creation until now. <laughs> I want to take your mind off those delicious hot cross buns at home, right? Or maybe those chocolate eggs that you're hiding somewhere. And I want to talk to you about the meaning and the significance of Easter. But before I do, my name is Seal Vailua and I am uh, privileged to be one of the pastoral leaders here at Salt Church alongside my beautiful wifey who has gone to take our son home. Um, and on behalf of, uh, of my wife and I, we'd just like to honour our senior leaders also um, who have been great mentors in our lives, Pastor Russell um, and his beautiful wife, Andrea, and also Pastor Sue. So, hey, can we show our appreciation? Can we honour our senior leaders, those who enable us to have the platform? We're so thankful for your leadership. So thankful. Man, I'm absolutely honoured to be able to bring a perspective of the Easter story this morning. So why don't you turn uh, your Bible or why don't you swipe your screen? <laughs> for those of you who are up to date with your technology, why don't you go with me to Mark 14? That's Mark 14. We're going to go from verse 17 and read through to 25. It's Mark 14, 17, and we're going to read through to 25. And this Bible passage will set the scene for us today, give us a little bit of context uh, of where we're going to go this morning. It's Mark 14, verse 17 to 25. When you got it, say, I. Come on. You feeling good? All right. And it reads like this. In the evening, Jesus arrived with the 12 disciples. As they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. One of you eating with me here will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked to turn, am I the one? He replied, it is one of you 12 who was eating from the bowl with me. For the Son of Man must die as the Scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible Will it be for the one who betrays him? It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Sounds pretty harsh. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take it for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. Watch this. I tell you the truth. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it in the new kingdom of God. Hey, can we pray? Let's pray. Hey, mighty God, I just thank you for our gathering this morning. I pray, Lord God, that you would speak. Father God, I thank you that you would use me as your vessel, Lord God, to declare your word and your truth this morning. I pray, Lord God, that people would be blessed in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Man. You know, for those of you who, who know me, then you would also know that I'm a proud dad. I love being a dad. My son's name is Luca Brave Vailua. Luca meaning bringer of light and brave speaking of itself. <laughs> and man, I love this kid, eh? I remember when he, fir he first turned six months. Sarah comes to me and she says, Babe, now that Luca is six months, I want to enroll him in swimming. I go, awesome. <laughs> and she says, and you're going to take him. And I'm like, for real? <laughs> I mean, if you know me, swimming 
and seal don't go together. <laughs> I mean, even at primary school, I, I actually never learned to swim. I got to high school and I, and, and I learned how to doggy paddle, if that's even counted as swimming. And so I guess you could say when it comes to swimming, I'm not all that confident. And yet my wife says, hey, you're going to take him swimming. So I man it up, right? <laughs> I get into my togs, the day comes, and we go to the swimming pool and I'm holding my son in my hands and I enter the water. What a moment. I enter the water and as I tentatively enter the water, I'm like, well, this isn't too bad. Come on. <laughs> and then the swimming instructor she yells out and she says, hey, parents, can you grab your kids? We're going to circle the pool. And I'm like, does she mean swim with them or like walk? Because I'm thinking walk. And so <laughs> we start paddling around the pool and I'm okay at this point. Like I'm fine. And then she starts singing nursery rhymes. But not just any nursery rhyme, London Bridge is falling down. So you can imagine in that moment, my heart's beating. I'm like, whoa, London, what? Thankfully, London's bridge was not falling down. I was still intact. And eventually I got over it and I really enjoyed it. Fast forward ahead of time. My son's now uh, over a year and a half. And then my wife's like, man, we're gonna go to the beach. And I'm like, cool, awesome, I'm down for the beach. She says, we're gonna take Lucas swimming. And I'm like, oh, what? We're going to go swimming. Man, Paul's one thing, but Mother Nature? Uh, and so I man it up again, right? And I'm like, I'm going to take my son swimming at the beach. So we get to the beach. I'm like standing there, like procrastinating as much as I can. But then my son, he starts running towards the water. He starts running towards the water and I'm like, babe. And she's like, Go and get him. And as any man would do, he follows instructions, right? I ran. I chased my son. <laughs> we got to the ocean and I grabbed him. And then I saw all these waves begin to roll in. And I'm like, really? Oh my goodness. I grip him with all my might. And I turn to the side so that the, the waves would crash against me. It's almost like instinctively, I just want to protect my boy. I want to protect my son. And you know, as I reflect on that idea, on that thought, I've come to realize a profound truth. You mind if I share some truth? A truth that is deeply ingrained in all of us and is at the very nature of our humanity. I mean, what in the world would cause me to want to participate in swimming activities? Come on, let's be real. <laughs> and let's be honest, we've already established that I probably can't swim, right? And yet when my son wants to go into the water, I instinctively protect him and I go in. What could possibly drive me to voluntarily do this? Friends, I can only put it down to one thing, love. L-O-V-E, love. I'm not gonna sing it. Love, whether you realize it or not, our greatest desire and our greatest human craving is love. Love is the heartbeat of our existence. Love is the greatest human need. Love is the greatest human desire. And love will even cause you to do reckless things like go swimming even when you can't swim. Friends, love is the true essence of the Easter story. It's the ultimate act of love. The Easter story is the greatest romance ever written in our human history. It is the story of a man who laid down his life for the one. Let me say it again. He laid it all down for the one, for you and for me. Jesus, He is the epitome of love. 
You know, as a Pacific Islander, nothing symbolizes love more than getting together to have a feed. Hey, getting together to partake in a meal. It's part of the DNA. And especially when your mom is cooking, right? Like every time my mom's like, we're gonna get together and I'm gonna cook, I'm like rejoicing inside, right? Because I can see the taro in the coconut cream. Mm. I can see the supper suey, the chop suey, and almost taste it. I can see the corned beef. It's not everyone's flavour, but I love corned beef, right? I can see it. But you know what? The family feast is so much more than just having a meal. It's how we, as family, we as people, connect and create relationship. In Mark 14 verse 12, it speaks of a time where Jesus goes to an upper room. And in this upper room, He has created a feast for His boys, His good friends, the 12 disciples. But when they arrive to this room, Jesus decides to do something that's so bizarre, unheard of before dinner. He decides to wash his friend's feet. You ever wash someone's feet? He decides to wash his friend's feet. And the crazy thing about this is you've got to remember that Jesus is a rabbi. He's a teacher. So for him to be washing his servant's feet, man, that's countercultural. That's like unheard of. And yet Jesus, the Messiah, Yo, Jesus, the teacher, decides that he would serve his servants. What an amazing picture. And then when they sit down, Jesus says to them, oh, by the way, (laughs) in the near future, one of you guys are going to betray me. Just putting it out there. (laughs) And the disciples look at him and they're, they're astonished. They're like, surely not. Not me. A guy called Peter, he's like, no way, Jesus. I would not ever betray you. And Jesus is like, but you're going to deny me. That's right. You're not just going to deny me once or twice. You're going to deny me three times. And I wish there was a different scenario or a different picture, but this is the truth and the reality of the matter. That you will betray me. And the disciples, man, they didn't know what to say. You know, Jesus chose to share a meal with his closest friends. But the paradox of this scenario is what blows me away because these very friends that he decides to dine with are the ones that end up betraying him. They end up denying him and they hand him over to be arrested. You know what? even though Jesus already knows this ahead of time. This is amazing. He shows during his last meal the supreme ethic of his character. That we must always extend grace and we must always extend love to all, even those who do you wrong. You know, to look at me today, you might think that I've always had it together, but I'm gonna tell you that that is far from the truth. For 18 years of my life, I endured adversity. I endured what you would consider pain. I endured a level of suffering that I would never want on anyone else. And for so long, I was a broken man a man that was absolutely wounded, a man that thought that he wasn't loved. And in this one moment, I arrived to the door of the counselor's office at my university here. 
And I decide that I would check in, maybe get some help. And part of me was like, man, I don't want to do this. Shame. But I knew that I was a wounded soul. And so as I entered the room, this beautiful lady, she sat me down and she began to listen. She asked me to share my story and I began to talk. She helped me to unpack the very deep things within my soul that I did not want to deal with. Now I remember her exact words. She said to me, Seal, it's not so much the fact that you're wounded and that you don't want to heal, but you need to forgive. What you're struggling with here is that you've left the door open, the door of unforgiveness open. And you will never be able to arrive to your destination unless you can close this door. I want to ask you something this morning. Is there someone that you need to forgive? Is there someone you've hurt that you need forgiveness from? You see, carrying unforgiveness is like getting a tattoo that you regret. Any regrets in the house? <laughs> Somehow you want it to be erased but you know that unless you start the process of removal, it will always be there. It will always remain. Friends, I know it's not easy to forgive someone who has hurt you, but you've got to understand that the journey of removing is starting by dealing with the deed, not necessarily the doer. Because by God's grace, I can tell you now that God can heal the hurt. He can heal the pain. He can heal the deed. But what you've got to hand over to Him is the doer. The person who inflicted this thing, that ain't yours to deal with. But what you can do is you can close the door of unforgiveness. Sometimes it takes a miracle to erase the hurt that wound us. The wounds that we carry. But I bet you if you look around today, you're probably sitting in a room full of miracles. You're probably sitting to someone who has experienced a miracle. Gone from a place of brokenness to whole. Gone from being addicted to whatever to being addicted to the Word of God and His promise, which is yes and amen, which is good and not evil. Friends, a miracle can take place in your life today. But only if you're willing to learn the art of forgiveness, which is love. Don't let unforgiveness hang around. Don't let unforgiveness make you bitter and angry. But let love prevail. And the Bible says that love covers a multitude of sin. Isn't that good? Like no matter what's happened to us, that love covers all of that. And the Bible also declares and defines what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in truth. It always trusts. It always hopes. And it always perseveres. Guess what? Love never fails. Friends, if love is God's supreme ethic, then we must also extend love to those who have done us wrong. Close the door on unforgiveness, just as Jesus did at that dinner table, remember? Just as Jesus would do for you and I. Just as Jesus would do for the one. You know, if anyone understands pain and suffering, it's Jesus. 
In Mark 14, 35, 36, God goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is on His road to the cross, His journey to the cross. And when He arrives there, He goes to pray. He goes away from a couple of the disciples that were with Him, and He goes away to pray. And this is what it says in the Word, that He fell down and He yelled out, Abba, which means Dad. Please take this cup of suffering from me. Yeah, let your will be done, not mine. You see, Jesus already knew ahead of time that he would experience pain. Jesus already knew ahead of time that he was going to be tortured, that he was going to be humiliated. He knew the outcome of what he was destined to do. And so what did he do in his darkest hour of pain? He wanted to be near his friends. The disciples. The ones that had walked closely with him. Whether you realise it or not, Jesus knows our pain. And through this picture in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus shows us how we are to overcome our darkest hour. Who's had a darkest hour? I know that I have. We need to surround ourselves with good friends. And that's why it's so important, even in in a gathering of this size, to connect into life groups. It's not just something that we promote from the front just for fun, right? But this is all part of having a meal. It's all part of building a connection. It's all part of building this important relationship. You've got to have a safety net. You've got to have friends. Why? Because in your life groups, man, you can share burdens with one another. Man, you can share whatever it is that is on your journey right now that you are, that you are painfully trying to get through. Man, life groups, they're your safety net. And man, if I can encourage you to do that, man, you need to get connected. Why? Because we were never created to do life alone. We were never created to journey alone. You guys okay? Jesus wanted His closest friends to be near Him in His final hour of pain. Why? Because... We all need a safety net. And we cannot conquer darkness on our own. We cannot defeat our struggles in isolation. We need the love and company of good friends. Amen? You guys feeling encouraged with that? You know, one thing that I do enjoy as an activity (laughs) with some of my friends is actually just going down to the local barber to get a fresh haircut. And I remember one time I went down with a friend and um, and he was getting a haircut. And about four days before that, I had already received a haircut. (laughs) And we arrived, my my mate, he was getting a fade. Then all of a sudden my eyes are like, wow, that's an amazing fade, right? That's an amazing haircut that I'm seeing before my eyes. And so the other barber, he turns the chair and he goes, hey, Seal, do you want a haircut? I'm like, hmm. In that moment, I could hear Sarah in my ear, right? I could hear Sarah saying, babe, you've already got $20 a month, right? And you're going beyond the budget. That's all I could hear. And so in that moment, I felt convicted, right? Felt convicted And then I did what any man would do. I jumped on the seat. I jumped on the seat and I got myself another fresh fade. I broke the budget. You know, isn't this true about the human condition? That sometimes we give in to our temptations and we know the cost. Can 
anybody hear me this morning? Jesus comes back after praying and finds that his friends are asleep, having a bit of a snooze. And then he says, Peter, are you asleep? Can't you like at least stay up for an hour? And why don't you just pray so that you can avoid temptation? So what do they do? The disciples go back to having a nap, having a good snooze, have a, have a good siesta. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. You see, although friends are important, and I love all my dear friends, friends still have limitations. <laughs> Why? Because we live in an imperfect world. We lived in a world that is, that is scarred, man. There's so much that goes on, so much confusion. We live in an imperfect world. So we all have good intentions, but sometimes those good intentions are rivaled by our free will and choice. Our choice not to love our neighbour. Our choice to do what we want, even if, even if it breaks the bank. You see, that is the moral failing of our human condition. Am I speaking to someone this morning? We know that there's extreme poverty going on, but we don't do anything about it. We know that there is pain and suffering around us, but we choose to look away. We possibly know that, that the kid just down the road is getting abused, but instead of intervening, we decide we'll keep our kids away from that. We won't get involved in that, and we'll just do our thing. You see, that's the moral failing of our condition as humans. Friends, we are all capable of doing the wrong thing. I hate to say it, but we're all capable of doing evil. Ouch. We need to understand that what we need is love. We need to understand the essence of what love is. But more than ever, we need to be in relationship with the one who is love. Why? So that we're not easily tempted? When the disciples wake up, Jesus says the hour has come. Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, betrays him and leads a crowd of armed men to arrest Jesus. At the same time, as Jesus predicted, nearly all the disciples desert him. They desert him and they run to their safety. But following not far behind is Peter. Then Jesus is brought before a rigged council of leaders, corrupt as. And then a servant girl notices Peter hanging around. Peter's watching Jesus get taunted. He's watching Jesus get spit on. And then this servant girl is like, hey, aren't you the one that's been hanging out with, the, with that guy, the Messiah? Like Jesus, weren't you the one hanging out with Jesus? And he's like, not me. As Jesus predicted, he didn't do it just once. He didn't do it just twice, but he did it three times. And Peter immediately denies his connection with Jesus. Then Jesus is then brought to a Roman governor by the name of Pilate to decide his fate. And after Pilate hears about all these ridiculous charges that they're trying to put against Jesus, you know what he does? It says that because he wanted to please the crowd, <laughs> he didn't want to be a man, because he wanted to please others and please the crowd, he decided to follow what they wanted because they were shouting out, just crucify him. 
And so Pilate says, let's crucify him. And so it begins. Come on, stay with me. The Roman soldiers lead Jesus to the courtyard. They strip him and dress him in a purple robe. They weave together thorn branches into a crown and they place it on his head. They salute and taunt Jesus in mock worship. The soldiers then strike Jesus on the head over and over again. They spit on him and they continue to mock him. And when they become tired of all of this, they lead him to be crucified. They make him carry his own cross in humiliation. They nail his hands and his feet to a cross. And as the crowds gather, they shout insults towards Jesus, saying, look, he can save others, but he can't even save himself. They shout, come on, come down, O King of Israel, if you're the Messiah. And Jesus does nothing. And then at noon, the Bible says that Jesus lets out a loud cry and he breathes. His last breath. At this exact moment, the curtain of the temple is torn in two from top to bottom. And a man who stands witness in front of Jesus is astonished. And he says, surely this man was the Son of God. Surely this man was the Son of God. Friends, if you know the story of Jesus and the miracles that He outworked here on earth, something tells me that He had the power to take Himself off that cross if He wanted to. Jesus could have easily taken Himself down from that cross. I mean, if He can part the ocean, if He can heal sickness, then surely He could take Himself off this cross. But you know what I've come to realise? That it wasn't nails that held Jesus on the cross because it was love. It wasn't nails who kept him on there. It was love. It was love. It was love for you and for me. It was love for the one. Friends, Jesus went to the cross for the one. But I'm gonna tell you some truth. He went to the cross for the one who wanted him dead. He went to the cross for the one who betrayed Him. He went to the cross for the one who denied Him. He went to the cross for the one who gave Him an unfair trial. He went to the cross for the one who mocked, spat and taunted Him. Jesus went to the cross for the one who whipped Him and put nails through His hands and put Him on a cross. Jesus went to the cross for the one who stripped him of his dignity. For the one who buried him in a tomb. Why? Because Jesus is love. Jesus is love. Man, I'm so thankful that's not where the story ends. And even though I'm crying, I'm like, man, I'm crying tears of joy. 
There's a reason why they call this day Resurrection Sunday. Because when two women arrived to the tomb where Jesus, He was buried, they noticed that the stone was turned. It was open. And so they enter the tomb and they see a man in a white robe sitting there. And it's not Jesus. But they notice that the body of Jesus is not even there also. And then the man in the white robe, he speaks these words. Don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. Your friends, don't be alarmed. So don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus who was crucified, right? Let me tell you, He has risen. He has risen. He has risen. Oh, come on, someone. Some of you need to know that even though He was buried, He moved that grave. He moved that stone because He was resurrected to the place He needed to be. Because when God died, guess what? He defeated death. Oh, He conquered death. And He says to you today, whatever it is that you've gone through, whether it's some kind of pain, it's some kind of anguish. Oh man, when He went to the cross, it's all nailed at the cross now. But when He went to the tomb, He says it is done. I've taken it with me. You no longer have to go through what you were never intended to go through. But I'm gonna tell you now, it's because of love that we are saved. Whether you realize it or not, God grieves a relationship with humankind. That's everyone. Because we were separated from Him when sin entered the world. And the only way to close that gap was to send His only Son to pay the ultimate price for humanity through His sacrifice. Through redemption. Redemption means to buy back, to pay a price or purchase. Jesus came to rescue us by taking our sin upon Him on that cross. You know what? He died for the one. He died for the one. But man, we can, we can stand here today. And even though we may feel burdened about what actually took place, man, I want to tell you, take hope. Man, today is your day of victory. Man, you don't have to go through what you've been through, but hopefully you've learned something from that journey because today God wants you to embrace hope. He wants you to know that you have a hope and you have a future. He wants you to know that you are loved, that you are cared for, that He is for you and He's not against you. And whatever has been intended for evil, God promises that He will use for your good. 